everyone, and welcome to the Modern CFO Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Seski. We're back from an end of summer hiatus with an exciting guest and episode. Today, we're joined by Jeremy Baxter, co-founder of DataFrame Ventures. Jeremy, welcome. Hey, Andrew. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited you're here today. Given the thought leadership and experience you have in founding, accelerating, and investing in finance and technology platforms. For those of you who don't know, Jeremy has a massive social following for his thought leadership in fintech. He also has 20 years of operational experience and was an SVP at Essential and created a lot of data products for the asset management group. Also led and built an alternative data product for Bloomberg. He's co-founded three fintech companies and really kicked off his entire journey in banking. So Jeremy, can you walk us through really just the very early days of uh, your career in banking and kind of how that led into really your entrepreneurial experience? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, so I think one of one of the parts of my background that really threads through is my dad's an entrepreneur. He was a metals guy. He had a steel mill, he had an aluminum recycling company. And it was always sort of imbued in me that you should understand how things work. You should think about how they should work better. And if you see a pathway or an idea, you should pursue it wholeheartedly. So that's kind of how I was raised in the 80s and 90s. So with that in mind, as after I studied engineering, Tech 1.0 was happening and booming. And Anderson Consulting came to campus and started to scoop up engineers from the UT Austin campus. And I was grateful to uh, be a product manager for, for several years, understanding enterprise SaaS and, and building out the first version of websites and call centers. I was a, a data person, a tech person, some coding, but mostly what they call process management, which is now product management. So I did that for several years and I kept itching to either start a company or understand capital markets better. You know, as a when you're a technical person, it's great to be able to do things and understand processes, but you don't often know who's who's leading the business or where the capital is coming from because you frankly don't understand balance sheets. And I kept feeling that imposter syndrome on starting a company without knowing. So I went to UVA, had a great time, spent two years really thinking about what I wanted to do. And it kept coming back to me that Wall Street is booming. It's a, a great place to learn. And I managed to convince JP Morgan to hire me as an associate, spent uh, about eight years doing banking. And during that journey, as an industrial tech, tech banker, every time you talk to a company, especially a big one, it always comes back to, in, in diversified land, what businesses do you want to own and which businesses do you want to get out of? And they kept getting out of things with heavy raw materials, have you know poor gross margins. You know, as, as you think about where you want to be in the stack, whether you're GE or Northrop Grumman or a big conglomerate, you typically want to be in that high margin, repeatable business and get out of the clunkier businesses. So every time I talked to these businesses, they all wanted to know, what do you see in IoT? What do you see in sensors? What do you see in clean tech? And even though I hadn't been an investor personally at any stage of this formation, I kept coming back to tech and data, SaaS. These are all changing the, changing the world. They're the highest multiple companies, whether they're B2B or B2B2C. You, know, you, you got to get into these businesses. So coming up with ideas is hard, but seeing what was happening in capital markets in the early 2010s, some colleagues and I from City joined up with uh, one of their former colleagues, and we created a private markets exchange. So there's there's been some, you know, second market, ours, Ace Portal, that were predecessors to what you see now, Forge and others, where you can get, you know, new investors into secondaries. That's really what we were focused on. So private assets, flipping LP interests and other illiquid items. You know, it, it was a little too early to overlay crypto into that, but what we wanted to do was really facilitate market making in a way that's faster than, say, calling your broker at UBS and saying, hey, I've got 10 million of Blackstone Fund 20. Can you flip that to a family office? So that exchange was our first foray, got the New York Stock Exchange behind us, ultimately sold it to a fund of funds called Beneficent Corp in Dallas. So my first you know, crack at entrepreneurship you know, it was not a gigantic unicorn exit, but it was an exit nonetheless. And it enabled me to start angel investing, you know, getting into Bitcoin and Ethereum and sort of ideating on my next ideas. So maybe just to take a pause, I'd say step one was having an entrepreneurial family, having a supportive, you know, wife and partner, letting me explore that journey. You know, it's really, e it's really easy to work your butt off in a common format where things are working, you know, deals fall from the sky when you're a banker, JP Morgan. But all of a sudden, when you have this no-name brand, no company, no revenue, no funding, even if you're a charming person, hopefully I am, you, know, you don't really get the benefit of that. And you're sort of shouting at the bottom of a well, trying to get money, trying to get clients, trying to get employees. So it, 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 it takes a lot to figure out that you're an entrepreneur and a lot of people aren't. So I'm, I'm grateful that that's just part of my upbringing. Well, I want to take a moment to talk about Ace for a second, just because... Not only was your first 
real venture marketplace, which is obviously so common now that marketplaces are really well funded with you know huge exits just in general. But you chose one of the most complex marketplaces across, you know, really to tackle. It's still something trying to be tackled today by really large companies in facilitating liquidity. How did you, what was inspiring? Was it the financial crisis in 08? So this was in 2010, 2011. Was it people trying to understand kind of what they owned in the, in the private asset world? Kind of what led the marketplace initiation in your mind? And then how did you attack that from an entrepreneurial standpoint, a technology standpoint, a regulatory standpoint? You kind of chose a lot of very challenging advents to the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey. You said it right. I, I would have my head examined if I ever had to do that again. I mean, I, it's almost like the, the fear factor is is almost nil when you just jump off a cliff and you have no idea how high it is. I would definitely say it was really challenging. So I think step one was Peter Williams, the founder and CEO, had been doing private placements for a long time. I had touched some of those private placements, but what he realized was two guys in a telephone is how this business runs. So the first step was automating a process. When you see a process that has very repeatable patterns, yet involves you know a ton of people, it doesn't often make sense to have all those people involved. So whether you're a real estate broker, private placements broker, you're just sort of thinking about if you could map all of the funnel of the 20 things you need to know, maybe some offering documents and put all the investors or interested parties in one place, hopefully they can transact in a more automated way. So I think the step one was, there's no leap of faith there to say, you have all these people, an expensive, clunky process. Can you automate that? So that that really spoke to me. So I wasn't the founder of that business. Our founder had been doing that a long time and really had the vision for it. On the tech side, we actually gave 20% equity to a company out in Brooklyn to create all of the tech. I had been the closest to tech. So I was kind of the natural product marketer, commercial product person. And we actually outsourced all of the tech. So Building that tech took a long time and was challenging and probably took way longer than we ever expected. It took us long, much longer to get funded than I ever expected. So all those things were tough. And then from a legal compliance standpoint, we had to decide, are we a brokerage or are we a software company? We ultimately realized that to be an ATS, to keep our brokerage licenses and to all do all those other things was very complex. We actually shifted more to the gateway model of having a software package and, and a listing fee rather than a success fee. Because we really, at the end of the day, at first, we're acting as brokers without taking brokerage fees. And we realized, A, that's not really scalable. And B, it doesn't really leak to the heart of what we wanted to do, which was automate this process. So it was really challenging. So we made these decisions step by step. So as a more of a listing service, it helped us attract the New York Stock Exchange because they they right. like the idea of we're not brokers, we're not bankers, we don't have lumpy revenue. We charge listing fees and we do services together. So once we had New York Stock Exchange as a partner, that also helped solve some of our distribution conversation because building brand, building trust, building those networks is very challenging. So having a corporate partner buy into the equity of a chunk of your business, I think at least for us, was very valuable. So these pieces stepwise took a few years to put together. But there, there's no question, all that complexity existed. And, and as you mentioned, family offices weren't doing deals online. Family offices go to New York, Hong Kong, Singapore, have conversations, use business brokers. So to have that leap of faith that they might attack our listing fees, that was not you know, an, an easy run. So we did make some progress, but I would tell you all marketplaces are massively chicken and egg. And you need to time very carefully which curated product do you have, how do you stoke the initial deals? Whether you're eBay finding that uh, Beanie Baby or Craigslist with San Francisco apartments, you got to have some reason for people to show up. So for us, at first, we started to do LP assets in hedge funds. We realized that was you know a fun market, but one that wasn't that liquid and people aren't necessarily looking for those unless there's a big secondary discount. So what we did try to do was more company stuff where people are excited about a Series A or a Series B and they can't get access. This was really early. So I know it's very common now, but that was our thesis eight, eight nine years ago. In fact, I would tell you there was a, a broker that wanted to put a chunk of uh, Theranos on the exchange. And it was the first time I'd heard of the company. And uh, he was so eager and keen to move a family office's chunk of 50 million onto the platform. You know, when something's too good to be true, it probably is. is, is. And uh, anyway, it, I, it was not something I'd expected to get offered a chunk of the Theranos uh, business. So we, we ended up actually passing because we just couldn't get comfort on any of it. So I guess we were a few years ahead of that trouble happening for her, but it just didn't feel right. So the short answer is step through each one of those challenges make your decisions and you live and die by those decisions because most of them are immutable. Once you decide to be a brokerage with you know, regulatory, you got to do that. If you're on the software side, 
maybe we, we, we chickened out in a way, but I think we did the right thing for us at the right time. We couldn't wait for years for all the regulatory layers to kick in. Well, I don't want to segue away from, you know, the path we're on, but it, it's so fun to talk to you because nth round was originally funded, you know, through an idea where instead of the uh, brokerage expenses, we actually did use a decentralized application to facilitate liquidity uh, on the private company side. It's still a piece of our platform today. Obviously, we've moved in and expanded really exponentially, but to try to realize that these problems are still really complex in the regulatory and technology and chicken and egg problem, it's still something that the industry is trying to meaningfully figure out. So maybe at the end, we can circle back as to how public and private markets are kind of merging into each other and really what the the alignment of incentives looks like. I mean, we've, uh, we have, we're just a privilege and the listeners are as well to get this perspective because the landscape has developed really, really rapidly in, in a unique way in the last you know, 10 years, but we'll stay focused for the moment. When you think about kind of your career in a whole, and we can move on to the next project that you started as well and move into Bloomberg days, but do you really think of yourself as it, has it evolved between operator, purely operator, entrepreneur, investor? Uh, I know that sometimes there's a career tracker banking and then, and then through, but you know, when you think of your journey as a whole, do you identify best with the uh, entrepreneur or investor? Andrew, it's, it's a question that I ask myself almost on a daily basis, but one of the topics you and I talk about a lot is the advancement of AngelList, for example, as a platform where an operator or a group of operators can easily stand up a syndicate and see if they can find unique data, you know, assets that are unique and differentiated and then push them into their LP community. You know, two partners and I stood up data frame ventures at the end of last year. We've done 17 deals, a few million uh, in capital deployed. It was almost by happy accident. We would find something we found interesting in a data oriented company. We'd put it up to our LP group. The first few deals took a lot of stoking the well and like calling people and actually acting as agents in a, in a way like, hey, we put this deal up. Are you excited about it? But by the fourth or fifth deal, we kept finding as you layer on LPs, as they understand your thesis, as you build up trust, deals were moving faster and faster and faster. So we almost spend almost all of our time finding interesting deals and zero time promoting them because they don't really require promotion if you have a really curated funnel. So I think it's emboldened me to go deeper into my life as a fund manager. I think with uh, unique access and talking to a lot of people and understanding one specific industry, that really is edge for me. So going really early into private companies in areas I understand well, that to me is my edge. So I am shifting more into a full-time investor hat. And I guess I would tell you that starting a fund is no different than starting a company. It's a little less um, focus on some crazy unique idea. It's more of putting your ideas into paper and actually framing those and wrangling LPs and getting people excited about you. So I, I think the rest of my life, I will probably mostly be an investor. I, I find that to be really fun. And, and look, between us, I've started or been a part of some really interesting companies, but I don't know that I'm a next level founder. You try it a few times. And if you don't have a unicorn exit, you know, society tells you you haven't succeeded. I see a lot of my friends and, and more people in the industry accepting of a 52 multiple hundred million dollar exit, as long as you're really helping and influencing people or building a unique product or something interesting and remunerating your LPs, you've done really well. You know, as we've talked about 95% or whatever the number is of companies in the seed stage, don't get to the series A stage. You don't always get to win. So having an exit that's 10 million plus, as long as you didn't raise 10 million is probably a good thing for everybody involved. So long story short, probably going to spend the rest of my life as an investor in part because I think founding is really hard. You really have to love something and commit to it for at least 10 years, or you're probably have already, you know, failed in that journey anyway. So it's a great question. And one I ask myself a lot. So do you think that the route to becoming an investor today, that barrier to entry has started to dissolve? I mean, it seems like there's a few really interesting um, kind of movements that's taking place. Obviously the venture industry has expanded really aggressively in the last decade with record numbers of both numbers of new funds and amount of money being raised, whether it's in you know strictly the venture side or all the way down through these uh, relatively new crowdfunding type portals or using an angelist type network. So it seems as if there's a decent democratization of information being available for these private companies and the offerings being distributed to more people. And it kind of represents kind of the changing faces of venture in general. 
I'm kind of wondering what you would attribute the ability for more operators to kind of be able to, and also sometimes operators who are still at these unicorns, be able to invest alongside, um, you know, companies that, you know, they would consider great opportunities at the same time. I don't think, I think that's a relatively new phenomenon. I agree with you. I think it's community and microservices. So if you can create your own brand and your own platform, I'm fortunate that on LinkedIn, I've had 20 years of you know putting posts up and writing blogs and so forth. I've now got 31 or 31,000 or so followers that tend to like some of my stuff in data, fintech, crypto, being a VC, being an entrepreneur. So I've got a good following there. And I think that's been really helpful for me. Some people use Twitter or whatever intellectual format to get followers. So I think you can build the brand and the community for yourself or your team. That's a that's a great start. And then the microservices piece, you know, great companies like yours, like ninth round, uh, nth round, um, you know, that that's really how you get involved. So if you can outsource legal, outsource compliance, get your custodian and do all that stuff in a relatively easy way, and it's all stored on the cloud and it's all locked up, it's it's pretty easy. So community and microservices are probably where it's at. And then the the willingness of everybody to be an investor. I think the retail movement, you, you see great companies like TradingView and others like allow anybody to be a stock statistician or understand what's happening in in crypto. There's some great companies that cover crypto well, really well, like Masari, that you know have institutional clients, they have retail clients. So as you said, the information, the access, the cloud, the services, the back end, if all of that is relatively easy and you've got a community and you've got a thesis, there you go. You know, you're an investor. And then once you start proving it with with some nice wins, the branding is a flywheel. It just keeps getting better and better. So we started with uh, your career studying in banking. We've moved through marketplaces and entrepreneurship. How did you go to creating a, a new product, you know, this alternative markets data platform for Bloomberg? I feel like that's a, a pretty significant leap and a, an amazing opportunity to build something really unique. Yeah. Could yep. you kind of bridge that gap yeah. for me? Building products is super hard. I, my hat's off to technologists and heads of product and people that can build. Building is is very, very hard. So my journey uh, after Ace Portal went through a few different steps and some of them were unexpected. So I was I was very fortunate to uh, be the CRO at Estimize under Lee Drogan. Lee taught me a ton about marketing and marketing yourself and understanding you know, from first principles thinking, uh, he's a really impressive guy. And I, I learned more than I realized from him in that in that time together. So what Lee was doing was creating at Estimize a unique data set using the crowd. So he had left Stocktwits thinking, people are getting more quantitative. What if I could actually pull traders and retail investors on their expectations on earnings and revenue per quarter? And you've got this unique data set that is great for StatArb and, and quants and quantumentals to try to beat the quarter or to now cast. Brilliant idea. I really embrace the crowd collection of data and then using it in a systematic way. It was a, both of those categories were very new to me. So after spending time with Lee, my very simple observation was there's only about 20 funds in the world with a gigantic budget and the ability to process data. And I knew because they were testing our data and several were buyers of our data. But as you started to walk it down to the next layer of you know, fund 50 down to a thousand that even has substantial AUM, they're still really not using data in their process. So I kept thinking about ideas in that category, ended up raising uh, a few million from a family office and brought some of my friends into a company called Connect, Connecting Equities for Quants. And what we were trying to do was really stitch together unique data sets in order to help facilitate kind of this quantum mental view for, you know, PMs in various industries. So if you've got an energy PM that wants to understand the size and depth of uh, the oil tankers around the world, and you had satellite imaging to sort of see that, is that something that helps you understand futures or pricing in that category? So I started, this was my first foray, foray into all data and I kept coming around to, wow, there's there's lots of different data sources. Nobody knows how to find them. There's very few people that can pay for and use them. How do you wrap all this into a bow and package it? I thought it was using the data structures and being more technical. But what I realized was after a year of trying to make that business go, it was you need trust and you need a big platform and you need distribution. So I was uh, talking to Bloomberg and a few others about acquiring the company or somehow working with us, I ended up being lucky enough to uh, to join Bloomberg and spend about three years there working with the enterprise data access portal and and putting a lot of unique data sets in there. It was the beginnings of what is now, you know, a pretty, pretty large, you know, all data practice, but it was early for Bloomberg. And one of the, you know, one of the industry telltale signs is, well, if you're putting unique product into one place and thousands of people can access it, 
is it really unique anymore? And I think the answer really is, I guess not. You know, in a way, we call it all external data, not alternative data now, because you're putting unique things in one place and maybe some of the alpha bleeds out on a one-to-one basis. But at the end of the day, everybody's got the ingredients and they cook together, right? There used to be an edge on getting the Wall Street Journal earlier than your neighbor. There used to be an edge on being able to buy a Bloomberg terminal. So everything eventually gets arbed out, but it's reflexive at that point. So you need to own it. So I think for me, building that marketplace was a lot of fun. We had data scouts, finding new data sets. I, I got the chance to talk to lots of hedge funds and asset managers And yeah, look, these things are hard, but when you already have an installed base and a brand, the thing that's hard is convincing people to focus on it, but you have the assets, the resource and the distribution. So being kind of an entrepreneur was a good role for me at the time. I like to uh, break glass a little bit. So I probably move around or have moved around more in my career than I'd like to admit, but I did end up you know, using the, the Bloomberg uh, sort of brand and, and institution to meet a ton of great people, ended up running Essentials e-commerce analytics business for them for some time as well. So finding unique e-commerce assets in-house that can be sold into asset managers and so forth. So I think... One of the areas of alt data that really interests me as it relates to being a VC is you've got an industry where most of the people are very Ivy League and very institutional. Some of that's flattening out. You've got a lot of really interesting emerging managers that are breaking the mold a bit, which is cool. But I would tell you that most VCs, they might say that they use data. And there, there are certain ones that are better than others. Let's say correlation ventures that really is a deep data, more of a systematic from a VC perspective, I think I, I've spent too much time in data. VC should use data more. There's no reason why we can't be scouting in you know, Eastern Europe or some new area to find undervalued assets. Because that's the other thing, Andrew, we can talk about all day long. Valuations are insane. I don't care what asset class you're talking about, but certainly in venture they are. So finding companies that are interesting, making progress and have traction, whether it's in an underserved market or somehow have a valuation gap, that, I think that to me is the biggest challenge of being a VC. And that's one I'm really trying to explore now in a few different directions. So we've had a lot of really interesting people on the podcast, whether they're private company CFOs, public company CFOs, angel investors, venture capitalists, and they all try to take a unique approach as you're trying to, as you know, we're discussing. But one of the things that we try to focus on on the podcast is just to, trying to picture out what a modern CFO or somebody who represents a, a modern company that would be an attractive investment opportunity would look like. And you just gave, you know, um, you know geography and demographic and, uh, you know, kind of the similarity of approach that kind of exists. What do you think that the, like the modern finance leaders or entrepreneurs are going to be looking like, or, or what do you see as a modern CFO that you could invest in? Are there key characteristics that you think separate given your experience across utilizing unique data sets or being an operator, an entrepreneur yourself, or even just experience from seeing you know, massive transactions on the investment banking side? I think the CFO seat is one that has a name, but they're so different, right? The types of roles you can play as a CFO. I look at my older brother and I admire him very much. He's been the CFO of a large public company for some time now. What, what he is really good at is process. One of those people that's a learning machine. He's a great leader. You know, He's led thousands of companies with thousands of people and lines of hundreds of people. That's sort of a, a very tactical CFO. And then he's done a lot of M&A. So it's sort of like, are you really good at process and having like a very big group of people reporting to you? Are you very good at being strategic and getting through tough and, and confusing transactions? Those are some of the bigger company CFO attributes, certainly on the private equity side or others where you're in a, a changing industry or the dynamics are moving against you. So you need to be a very tactical money-saving CEO, a CFO. That That's like another one of the elements. And then of course, there's the young company CFO that almost acts like a COO or CEO and has to be very tactical from a different perspective. So when I look at the modern CFO, it's almost like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Are you eventually the CEO? Are you very strategic? Are you more like a COO and you're really like process oriented? Or are you a visionary that you know wants to figure out what pieces need to be pulled in together? What capabilities do you not have? Getting closer to the CPO, more of a product CFO. There's so many different ways to be a CFO. One of my good friends just started a CFO outsourcing practice. And what his design is, is he wants to work with companies from like 10 to 100 people and you know be a fractional CFO in the sense of making sure the PL is great, 
everything's neat and tidy. You're able to re- re- receive VC interest and VC money. And then, you know, I kind of move on. And, and I think that's a, that's an interesting way to go with it. You know, like a small company doesn't necessarily need a CFO. They probably just need somebody that's really good as a bookkeeper. So th- I just described an incredibly broad range, but I think it's almost looking <laughs> in the mirror at yourself and saying, what do I like? What am I good at? I'm obviously good at, you know, the accounting and like the basics, but how can I lever up myself and like be a better CFO, a CFO that's really good at data science. You know, if that exists, maybe that's a very tactical CFO that can find m and assets and work closer with the corp dev team. I think there's a lot of cross-disciplinary actions that are happening now and people need to be good at one, two or three things aside from their primary seat. So that's almost how I look at a CFO differentiating themselves. Are they good at one of those? There's some CFOs on Twitter that I won't name that are incredibly brilliant and have broadcasted themselves in a way that you know their next seat is a CEO because they're really strategic. They just happen to be coming to the finance vertical. Yeah, it's a really interesting thought. I don't. I think that's one of the, you know, more unique answers to that question we've gotten so far. And I think you're right. There's just such a an onus on being, you know, the public face of the finance team looks different for different groups. And I think it is a big um, piece of having a really successful relationship with your CEO to understand who has you know, different sets of skills to be not just a leader of the company, but to inspire the the rest of your team. I think being very honest and accountable as to what your strengths are probably goes a really long way. So one one comment I would make is uh, I was I was able to go to the Salt Conference this week and uh, oh, heard cool. from Jeb Bush, Paris Hilton, Steve Cohen. Uh, is and, and, <laughs> Scaramucci does a wonderful job of creating a really great set of uh, people to talk. And uh, I think one of the perspectives I always draw from these kinds of things is. What, what are these people talking about? And I, I would tell you that maybe selfishly, a lot of the topics I've gravitated to are where their heads are at. How do you create organizational alpha? Is it being awesome in process? And as a hedge fund, do you have unique data assets? Like, what are you really good at? Are your PMs really good at risk management? Are you getting more into crypto and some of the newer assets? Where is the edge? Where is the globality? Where is the risk management? Particularly in a time where you know, MMT is rising in a way that is is sort of, we're in the third wave of this cycle, whatever this is, the long tail and uh, trying to figure out how do we remunerate people? How do we keep people motivated, particularly at the bottom of the economic cycle? It's, it's really challenging. And Ray Dalio is somebody I admire significantly. And he was giving this conversation around really just knowing where we are in the cycle. He's even getting pretty deep into crypto and other assets where he just knows that the stack has moved. You know, <laughs> Hedge funds are getting into venture capital. Venture capital is getting into private equity. Private equity is getting into public markets. Like Everybody's converging. So being crisp on finding new assets and frankly, hedging yourself against inflation or where it's at, you know, Mike Alfred's a, a, a friend of mine. And uh, I heard him on a podcast yesterday, the Preston Fish So He was just saying, look, anybody that doesn't understand crypto, I just tell them it's, a, it's an MMT hedge. It's, it's mm. basically an MMT hedge. And if you don't get that, fine. You don't have to like Bitcoin or crypto specifically, but find your hedge. And a lot of people are finding it in crypto, including some of the smartest people in the world that have gone on record saying that, including Ray Dalio. So I do want to take a moment and I want to hit you with a couple of rapid uh, fire questions and I'm going to open it up across uh, some really, really broad themes at the end here because we're, we're hitting a ton, but I want to dial in for a few quick ones and just then again, just really, really open it up because I, I'm really interested to hear. I always ask kind of the same question at the end of, of every podcast to really open up to hear what you think is really underestimated in the world today, but we'll get that to that in a minute. Thinking about, you know, you just went to this conference too. It's probably going to influence a little bit about the answer to this question. But just in terms of your thinking right now in investing, what's top of mind today? And what are you thinking about just in the next 12 months? I think the most interesting topics are bleeding edge tech, crypto, and other areas where you have a chance for massive uh, equity ups. And uh, I don't know how big of a percent of anybody's portfolio that should be, but I think it's important to be looking at that. And I know we've talked a little bit about NFTs together. I, I'm not sure that I fully get you know, licensing a JPEG or owning a JPEG, but I got to tell you that when you see... I was looking at crypto dads yesterday. It's kind of like a Simpsons avatar with, with a dad in it, and there's 10,000 of them. It started off as almost zero Ethereum yesterday, and they're already at like two right now. So when you see things go from zero to the US equivalent, dollar equivalent of 
let's say six, seven, eight thousand dollars. JPEGs go from zero to ten thousand dollars in forty-eight hours. You should probably be paying attention to that trend, whether you ride it or don't. So, crypto is probably near the top of my mind. And then some of these overlapping companies where there's crypto, a token, and a real asset. A friend of mine is an advisor to Lofty AI. Lofty is buying you know properties and licensing out those properties, and there's a token involved, and you have unique access to the cash flow of a specific asset. You're going from a single family homes, kind of invitation homes, Blackstone style business with, you know, instead of buying 3,000 at a time and owning them, you can own one at a time or fractions of them, get the cash flow and own a native token. That just, that type of engineering is incredible to me. I know ICO fraud and things that happened three to five years ago really tampered the market for a while, but I think you're going to see a resurgence of true businesses with cash flow, things as simple as owning real estate and servicing real estate as a property manager and offering token and fractional ownership. You tie all those things together. And that's really what I'm thinking about. How do you invest in cash flowing items that also have intrinsic value that can go up significantly? Those are the types of assets I find really interesting. Absolutely. So in launching data frames relatively recently, we talked about how becoming an emerging fund manager and launching a fund is very similar to the challenges associated with launching a new firm. What do you think the biggest operational challenge is in doing so? And how, like, if you had a magic wand, which one would it, would you solve? Would it be a fund formation, fundraising, communicating with investors, finding a unique deal flow? What would be the biggest operational challenge you could magically solve? Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps for me, whether it's a company or a fund, it's always finding the funding. You got to find people to believe in you and wire you money. Lots of people will tell you that your baby's pretty and then walk away and not really invest in the baby. And it's very easy for VCs, family offices, institutional LPs to say, this is interesting, but not right now. Come back to me in six months. It's very easy for them to give you optionality. It's very hard for them or hard for you to convince them that there's urgency and you need to wire now. So I think that's the hardest part is creating a product, creating the product marketing, imputing that vision into who you want to follow you and invest in you, and then providing the FOMO. You know, Hey, this is going away in 60 days. We're fully subscribed. That kind of marketing conversation is really challenging. And maybe for me, like I'm not sure that my product is the most differentiated in the world. I believe it is. I'm an entrepreneur, so I have to believe in that. And I, I think I do generally, but getting other people to resonate with that, I think is the toughest. Deal flow, you know, deal flow is, is not a problem for most funds or for me. I see lots and lots of deals. Having said that, timing, speed, conviction, commitment, you know, those things are hard. Having real conviction on somebody, especially when you don't have a strong signal yet, that's really hard. I mean, I play in the angel and seed space right now. And you really believe in people. And I've seen rounds now, multiple millions going into you know 15 million valuations for pre-product companies. And you're only relying on your gut, the knowledge you have of that person and their ability to execute. And that's a really hard bet. Anything you can do to, to uh, parse through the signal as fast as possible on product market fit, that's really what I look for. It's like trying to find a company where you can get a few access to a few of their early customers and really get a sense for, is this something that you would double down on? And do you think 100 people in your industry need it? That's really like where I spend most of my time. But spinning it backwards, I would say creating a product, creating a vision, getting a website thrown up, convincing two or three or four people to join you. Those things are all hard, but actually taking that and getting an LP to wire you money that's that's always the hardest. Clients, <laughs> get your clients and get your LPs, line them up in the same time frame before the money runs out and you give up and go back to corporate. Yeah, one of the early pieces of advice I got from one of Anthron's co-founder, and the I hear him repeat this all the time, is that in the very beginning, you've got to either have people who are irrationally in love with you or in, irrationally in love with your idea. If you don't have either of those, you're, you might be um, in for a hard row ahead. Which might be a little, again, a little bit different right now in the current fundraising environment of being you know, some of the uh, YC assets that exist today. And what do you think the biggest operational challenges you've overcome has has been? Like, in, maybe even in uh, not just data frame. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's knowing when you're in a cul-de-sac, and and <laughs> most people don't really talk about this, but if you have a product that you believe in and you think is going well, but somehow, some way, you you just don't have revenue. Let's say year one, one of the toughest decisions I had to make was leaving my my startup, my third, and going to Bloomberg and acknowledging that I didn't build anything useful. I don't want to keep pushing this along. I don't want to ask anybody else for money. I'm willing to and able to reformat who I am into more of a corporate role and to try to be an innovator in corporate. That was really challenging, right? And I'm not saying you get through all of them. And for me, knowing 
that it was time to throw in the towel. Like th- there's nothing harder than ad- admitting defeat, but better to admit defeat early and move on and be able to pivot. I think that was one that, you know, taught me a lot. Knowing, knowing when you don't have the daylight and accepting that is hard. I mean, I've known some people at the angel or seed stage running their companies for 10 years because maybe their dad put in the money or they feel committed or convinced or they need to do it for their co-founders and they don't accept defeat. That's really cute in those Hollywood stories that occasionally happen where we pivoted one last time and you know created a unicorn, but most of the time that's not the case. So I, I guess for me, it's just acknowledging defeat and, and moving on from it. That's hard. You know, Take your next shot, knowing when to take your next shot. So I normally ask something along the lines of, you know, a, a book you'd recommend or a way you got through the pandemic in terms of, you know, you, whether it's distraction of an educational pursuit or research or something like that. But I feel like for you, I have to ask more along the lines of where are you getting today your inflow of information or what do you rely on most, whether it's a newsletter, podcast, tools, or maybe something, maybe assume that we've got, you know, the Wall Street Journal you know, a few thought leaders that we all subscribe to and LinkedIn, you know, what's a, what's something that maybe the listeners haven't heard of or wouldn't know to look for. Maybe it's a, you know, FinTech or a, a crypto based learning tool. Is there any kind of unique place that we should all be looking for information from? I mean, given your, you built a lot of these uh, you know, data platforms, but right now you're investing. So are there other people you've relied on to carry that torch? It's one of those things where I find parsing through the information is the hardest. I don't rely on traditional sources like the Wall Street Journal often. I do have a Bloomberg subscription. I admit I kind of got addicted to it. So I have that. But most of the signals that I see are really on Twitter. I find that following the smartest people in each category I like and just being rabid about what they're saying, following their blogs, going where they go. I think that's very useful. In my past, I've tried to read one long form book a week every year. And I've, I've, I've managed to do that most years. I would wow. say this year, I did not keep up that pace. And I'm really disappointed <laughs> to admit that. One of the books I read through the pandemic was Range. I know it's a pretty well-known book, but Range by David Epstein about, look, being multidisciplinary is where we need to be. I think being awesome at one thing works if you're an, an NFL star or a rapper or some, well, look, even, even musicians and artists do eight different things. Now I saw Paris Hilton this week, talk about her perfume, her jewelry, her, you know, hoteling, her NFTs. I think an artist that's multidiscipline that already has an audience can obviously be a billionaire compounded many times, but I think um, reading long form books is useful. I typically hear somebody talking about a book and that's the one I gravitate to. Podcasts are great. I'm just looking at my list of podcasts, Lex Fridman, Tim Ferriss, My First Million, Stuff You Should Know, We Study Billionaires, The Breakdown, Meb Faber Show. I I love podcasts. Long form, listening to really smart people really distills distills knowledge down in a way that's very useful. So I'd say whenever I have a free gap, I'm, I'm on Twitter following some great people, the usual suspects. I mean, I try to find some people that are underfollowed, but those people tend to be great and break out pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I have to recommend another, I'm probably not supposed to do this on my own, but the Acquired Podcast is a great podcast for for investors. You know, they started the idea with uh, looking just at really successful acquisitions and they ran out of episodes pretty quickly. So they uh, have really changed into a, a really amazing podcast and talk to incredible people. I know you'd enjoy it and the rest of our listeners, obviously, as well. So now I want to open things up a little bit and maybe give you even just a moment to think about this question. And I asked it to a lot of CFOs because I think they've got unique perspectives of just different pieces of organizations that aren't quite as transparent to the public. But I think you've got a really valuable perspective as well in a number of ways as we just covered. So in thinking about just the entirety of the conversation so far and all of the things that you're currently looking at, what do you feel is the most underestimated by others in the world today? And is there someone who's addressing that that is inspiring you? After being an M&A guy for a long time, I always think about portfolio success, especially for the companies I work with. And I think a lot about what are you building? Who are you building it for? And on a few boards I sit on, I try to reverse engineer that. Are you building for your clients? Are you building for your customers? Are you building to remunerate your investors? Who is the stakeholder that you care the most about? And a person that's really inspired me a lot, who's actually on Twitter, his name is Andrew Gazdecki. 
He's the CEO of MicroAcquire. Yeah. Micro, MicroAcquire, I'm an investor through one of the emerging managers I invested in. So I'm not a direct investor. I am cheering this guy on every day. And the reason I do is I think he's so clever. He's got a partnership with ClearCo. He's, yep. he's built, building himself a great brand. And MicroAcquire is fantastic. You know, a lot of a lot of my friends ask me, what happens when you get stuck? What happens when you get to 2 million revenue? What do I do? How do I exit? So I, I think the area that's most interesting is small market M&A. And I'll tell mm-hmm. you why. You know, when you're a big company and you're acquiring assets, maybe you're data-driven, maybe, maybe you know the companies you want or the technologies you want, but there's a lot of orphan assets that actually make money that aren't big enough for a private equity fund to buy them into. They're not sexy enough to roll up into six other companies. And look, people get stuck and they ask me questions like that. And I'm like, find some sell to one of your users, you know, figure out a path. Are you spackable? Like, how are we going to get you out of this? So right. I, I, I love what micro is building. And I think linking it to a financing source is really smart. And actually I follow him on Twitter and I really enjoy his commentary. So wrapped in a bow, I'd say Andrew Gasdecki. Don't know him personally, but I'm, I'm, I'm a fast follower of him and really enjoying what he's been doing. In fact, he announced the ClearCo partnership yesterday by going to Cameo and getting a bunch of really hilarious people and rappers to talk about the acquisition. So a really unique way to announce a, a partnership. I'm yeah. super impressed with his creativity and his brand marketing. I saw the uh, the Trace Commas uh, <laughs> shout out there. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, we have had uh, Kurt, who is the CFO of ClearCo on the podcast. He was a few episodes ago, and it sounds like we need to get Andrew as, as another guest. We can really go full circle between the CFO of <laughs> ClearCo, an active investor, and uh, that founder. That'd be really fun. And I think you're right. I think he's, uh, he's going to do big things. And it's also solving one piece of your original equation, which is you know, can you facilitate liquidity in a meaningful way in the private markets? And, you know, really all of those institutional grade tools have been built around the pre-IPO infrastructure or, you know, yeah, basically just the late stage venture backed secondary market. And really the underserved entrepreneurs are still in that kind of smaller M&A field. So I, I'm, I am excited to watch that grow and uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to reach out and see if we can get him to share the conversation with us soon. Unless there's anything else you want to jump into, I did want to be, make sure that the audience could find you and kind of enjoy the thought leadership as well. How do you uh, suggest people get in contact, uh, whether they're interested in learning about data frame for investment opportunities or even following you on social? Is there any way that you want to let people know that they can get in touch with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm really active on LinkedIn and uh, I've hit the 30,000 cap on connections. So I now I'm only <laughs> followable unless I disconnect from somebody, but I don't think that's really fair. So please try to find me, Jeremy Box on LinkedIn. And then I, I have been on Twitter for, for many years. I actually took one year off. I thought that Twitter was too addictive and I was spending too much time on it. So I actually took a pause. I admit I missed it too much. So I've had to reframe my account. It's Jay Boxed. I'm back on Twitter. I only have a few hundred followers. So if you'd be kind enough to uh, refollow me, that would be really appreciated. Great. Well, I know that you'll be around for a long time to go and uh, you know, continue to establish yourself as a meaningful investor and partner to a lot of entrepreneurs. So looking forward to the opportunity to have you back on the podcast soon. And just want to say thank you so much for joining the Modern CFO. Oh, Andrew, look, my pleasure. And uh, I know you're building an interesting uh, discipline and practice there. And I think helping emerging managers at uh, Nth Round and, uh, you know, being kind to people like myself, it's virtuous. So I'm a big fan and uh, and grateful to be on with you and uh, enjoy the conversation. Excellent. Well, thank you again. And this has been the Modern CFO Podcast. Until next time, it's Andrew Seski, and I'll talk to you soon. 